Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. You ever thought to yourself, what do some of the best dental practices track as far as data goes? Well, if you've ever wondered that, we're going to take you right inside of it. So as practice coaches, we take a look at data insights from some top thriving practices. So recently, we did a webinar on this with Angela Heffman, one of our amazing coaches here. And we take this all apart in how the best look at their data from production to collections to overhead. And it was so much fun, I thought I would share the audio version of the webinar on the podcast. So here it is. I hope you guys enjoy it and we'll see you soon. Thank you guys for joining us today. We have a great webinar um, and we're going to be talking about tracking success, data insights for thriving dental practices with the amazing Angela and Robin. I actually just told her just to jump on a plane and head this way because she's coming here for to the top and uh, schedule is a little tight. So I thought you just go. So Angela, thank you for being on. Appreciate you. My pleasure. Yeah. So um, some of you already know, this is a huge passion of ours today. So we're going to be talking a lot about data. And today is going to be more about what do we do? How do we do it? What insights do we look at? And uh, in a world where there's so much information, this is a great way to improve your profits and just feel better about your future. But before we get started, uh, I want to do this and uh, just kind of share with you what we're up to. Uh, if you're part of the Best Practices Association already, you know how this works. We've been creating this community, and it, it's it's more from the Act Dental U community into Best Practices Association. Now there's several hundred people in there, and we just share great tips, best practices, tools. It's a great community. Um, dentistry is way too hard to figure out on your own, and if you want to do it on your own, you can do it with a group or uh, do it with the community back here. And it's, it's the Best Practices Association. And uh, we encourage you to join us. Uh, we also have our To the Top Study Club, which Angela mentioned. And we do this quarterly where we have some of the best thinkers in all of dentistry uh, show up. And we now have two groups of almost 50 in each one of them. And it's so much fun. And we share uh, brand new concepts. It's a way to get away from your practice and think better about the challenges that you have. And uh, if you haven't been a part of this, we love it so much that we have what's called the golden ticket. And the golden ticket is you can come check it out for free. And uh, if you don't love it, that's okay. And you can take all the information, learn for a day. It's only from eight to three on certain Fridays. Um, and you don't have to stay, but that's how much we believe in it. So if you want an opportunity to check it out, I highly encourage you to check it out. And Gina, G-I-N-A on our team, uh, and her email address is Gina at actdental.com. She'll hook you up. She'll be your personal concierge. So that's so cool. And um, you get to hang out with Angela and I. And tomorrow, Miranda Beeson is going to be leading the workshop on what we find are the best practices and culture. So that's a little bit about the golden ticket. And then lastly, our core business, if some of you don't know what we do, we're coaches. So we're geeks about this stuff. This is all we do. Angela is an amazing lead practice coach here. And so what we do is we coach practices all over the country that aren't necessarily broken. They're actually really good practices, but they just don't know how to maybe make things a little bit better because they're so busy working with their team and patients so uh, we help them create a better practice and a better life. So on, that's how it works. And then we're on, constantly adding resources. This resource today is just one of the many resources. I think we have several hundred videos back there. 
And so if you're looking a way to train your team, bring them up, uh, get you all aligned, or if your team meetings are just terrible, don't do that anymore. We've got some great resources back here that you can just hit play and we can lead your team meetings. Uh, and you'll see that back here. And we also have an app that we're developing and we'll actually be developing our own personalized app, but we actually do have an app right now that you can use once you join the Best Practice Association. So you can take it on the go. Some of the best clinical minds, some of the best practice management tools are all right there um, so that you can use them. So today we're going to be talking about tracking success, data insights for thriving dental practices. Now I'll share with you what we're going to do. And at any point, Angela and I will answer questions. So go ahead and throw them in the chat. I love to be interrupted and I love a little bit of a dialogue, but here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the why. And uh, again, this is all we do is just coach great practices. We're going to show you the inside of what we normally take a look at and the why. We're also going to talk about production, what data insights you need to know about production because a lot of people say, well, just produce. Well, what does that really mean? Because it, that can have multiple meanings. Uh, we're going to talk about the ins and outs of collections, what you need to pay attention to in collections and why that is so important. I know everybody thinks, well, we collect all of it. No, you don't. And in a lot of cases, uh, we don't know what we're striving for. We're going to give you some uh, good targets here. we we'll talk about overhead and uh, the ins and outs, fixed and variable expenses and what you need to know about those and why. And then truly what is profit? You know, sometimes people don't define profit well, and we're going to do that today. And then we're going to kind of wrap this up and give you the moral of the story and what to do about it once you get a chance to see this. And so let's go ahead and start with the why. And so I threw a couple of graphics up here because this is what we call our gaps overhead. You know, our, it's our gaps you know, scorecard. So tomorrow, and this is a, you know, this is a scorecard, uh, as you can see, I put Dr. Barrett Straub up there, but, uh, tomorrow, if you're in the, to the top study club, we print out these scorecards and we track, or actually our dentists and teams in the act dental community track each dollar that comes in. And you'll see how this relates through the day, and what this means, and I'll, I'll walk you through each one of these components, but we're going to talk a little bit about the effort gap, what goes in the effort gap. We'll talk about the collections gap. We'll talk about what truly is overhead. And then at the end of the day, you're going to have profit and that's called the cash flow gap. But what's really cool about this is that once you start to track these numbers and you can see where they go, you get more and more information and more insight on your dental practice. And it just creates a lot of clarity around your decision-making. And that's what we hope comes out of it. And you can design a spreadsheet just like this on your own if you wanted to. Um, but we do it for all the people that are in the To The Top Study Club and the people that are in our um, pro coaching program. But ultimately, here's the why, is that when you get all this data right, you can see the money. You can see how it moves through the practice from production to down to dollars in the bank. And then you can also start to see trends. You're going to see trends on which services are most profitable and where maybe we can save a little bit and reduce some expenses. And then lastly, what's really important about doing this is you can start to make strategic decisions about how you allocate resources are we going to put any money in marketing, you know, and then it leads to intentionally improving your financial stability and profitability. And I'll tell you what it does for me is I just sleep well. That's all it means. I sleep well. I'm not easily distracted um, by a podcast or other things, or somebody said, do this. When I can look at the trend, and things are moving in the right direction. And I can look at the effort that I'm putting in and profit continues to grow every single month. Now we're all aligned on these things. And anything you would add to the why behind this that you see? It's just really important to know how you're actually doing. A lot of doctors just run on emotion and they feel like they need to be, you know, just moving all the time and really busy. And they don't always just stop and pause to see um, if what they're doing is working. So it's just really important that we do this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I've been doing this a long time, three decades. I'm shocked still to this day 
on how little dentists actually know about their business. You know, I, I would think that I'd run into 50% of them to go, yeah, I know exactly what my overhead is. I know exactly where these costs are. I know I'm shocked. It's probably less than 10% have their arms around it just because they don't have a good model or they don't do it. I will tell you just by tracking it regularly, you learn so much. You get angry. You go, what is that? I go, I don't know. It's your practice. Like, what is that? You also start to see things that you're like, I don't know why we do that. So I think it's important to track this. It helps you identify inefficiencies right away. They're just going to show up. You're going to go, that doesn't make any sense. And you'll, you can say, okay. Now, the other thing is it tells you what to do. If you read them regularly, you, with the help of a great coach, you can start to, you know, decode this. Um, but you can start to eliminate bottlenecks. You can streamline processes. One of the things that we do here in our coaching program, we're big fans of systems. So if you've ever been through the ACT program, ask anybody who's been through ACT. They'll go, oh my gosh, that's a lot of work because you design all these systems. You make everything crazy organized. You write so many. It's so organized and it's a lot of work. Well, you know what happens? You get really efficient because everybody knows how things work. And uh, you can see how it impacts the daily operations. And a lot of our teams will go, wow, I started doing this whole process. I had meetings. I had to design systems that, that guide our processes. And I start to know my overhead and we now have profit. It's so much fun for me because tomorrow what will happen is I'll sit in the room and people will say, wow, we're in the green this month. And we're a lot in the green because when we started this pl process, we were in the red. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, they might not know what they're doing. It's amazing to me how many practices north of 1.5 million in gross production are not taking home a true profit. They might be taking home a gross profit, but not a true profit, which means, I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a second, but um, hopefully through this, we can start to identify this. But what does this mean for you? So if you're a practice owner, again, and it goes back to this, I'll repeat this over and over again, tracking this information. If you create a spreadsheet as a result of this, take some screenshots of this webinar, just say, I'm going to do my own stuff, or you can just call us and we'll do it for you. We'll help you get it all organized. You're going to have a lot of clarity around your practice. You'll feel more in control. And if you're like me, you're a control freak. So you like control and you like to know where things are and you'll just have a sense of relief. You'll sleep better. You'll feel better. And um, the, at the end of the day, the truth of what's happening in the world is that a lot of people are producing more and more and more. I've never seen gross production numbers like this. They're actually quite high. And I'm amazed by how high the gross production is. But you've heard me say this again and again, but people that are participating with PPOs heavily, sometimes the average write-offs are as high as 42 and 43% which means they're almost working 50% of their time for free. And we don't want that. So um, we're going to show you a little bit more of that. Now, we're going to dive into the second component, which is production. Now, people say produce, produce, produce. Well, that has multiple meanings. And let me explain. Let's start with the big one that everybody mostly knows about. It's called gross production. And defined our way, it's basically the dollar amount of procedures that you complete in your practice. And what it really means is it's the full effort that you've put into producing dentistry in your practice of the maximum potential. Now, I don't have this on a slide, but there's inherent challenges with gross production. A lot of people don't know what their real gross production is for multiple reasons. Number one, they don't put in their full fee every single time, all the time for every patient. You should. Number two, sometimes they don't enter in any production at all because it's a friend or their sister came in. And so they just leave it out. Don't put anything in the computer. So I, I'm a big fan of putting it all in. And all it does is it shows your effort. And I think it also gives us a good representation of how you spent your time. So if you're not entering in your full fee or you're leaving out some of those things, we can't get our arms around your full effort in time with that output. And so anything else you, I'll always pause, Ange, because I can just talk forever and just 
take over. But anything you would add about gross production? And you know, you I won't is- interrupt you either. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add that, you know, sometimes this means not just going by what your software spits out as the information, you know, sometimes this means like pulling multiple reports and then doing some calculations on your own. And that's what Kirk's going to go through today. Um, because sometimes we just don't have all the information in one single report. So we have to do a little bit of math to figure out what our true gross production is. Totally. That is a super, super great point. So, and as we start to work down this now in production or effort gap, there's this thing called write-offs and write-offs are climbing and write-offs defined our way or the act way are the dollar. It's a dollar amount of adjustments to production that are not collectible. So those could be PPO write-offs. They could be membership write-offs. They could be uh, elective write-offs. Sometimes there are many practices in the act community. They have as many write-off categories as possible so that we can truly allocate where they're giving it away. And what this really means is it's money that you're giving away either contractually or electively. And it's the silent killer of a lot of practices because they're just producing more. So we're big fans of really getting your arms around the write-offs. And once you really identify the write-offs, and again, if you have multiple categories, that's great. You're going to find what your net production is. And so that's the third component of production, which is defined our way are the dollar, it's the dollar amount of production after adjustments are made. So after all that is made, that is the collectible amount of the effort that you made. So I know a lot of people say, well, I produce 3 million. Well, our net production is 2 million. So that means that that's actually what's collectible in there. And it's important to identify those discrepancies. And so you want to get the most out of your effort in, that you put in is number one, understand the write-offs, the insurance, the electives, and the memberships, uh, and then determine your future with dental contracts. Now, let me go here. So as, if you were creating the sheet on your own, we're talking about the effort gap. So up here, you can see you know, I got my gross production. I got my write-offs percentage. Now let's just take this practice on average. So this is actually a pretty good performing practice. So write-offs are at about 14%. Um, that's the dollar amount that's allocated towards write-offs. And so that would be our net production dollar amount. And then you also want to take a look at the number of days that you were open in order to do that. So I'll just give you a target. And this isn't on the slides. I always love it when our doctors... So the average dental practice in the United States, according to the ADA, solo practitioner works 220 days a year. I think that's way too many days. I love it when our doctors that we see are produ- you know, working somewhere around 180 uh, to 188 days a year, and they know exactly what they produce and, and, and collect and what their net production is. But this is your effort gap. And you want to get a, get your arms around how hard are we working? Now, let me pause on this one first before we go on to the next one. Because here's, here's another why. So many dentists are working harder and harder and harder for less and less. And then they go home to their spouse or significant other and they go, I am working my tail off for us. And what happens is, is you get into this this disparity about how hard you're working and how much you're making and nobody can get their arms around it. One more thing I'm going to add before we get to overhead. People in dentistry, if you listen to any conversation, people are talking about how overhead costs are rising. The ADA Health Policy just published a great study on how overhead expenses are rising. They are, but no one is talking about why. They're just saying costs are going up. Well, costs will continually go up. But what they're really not saying is no one's pointing to how write-offs are impacting that. Because if you're an office that's writing off 33%, which means you're working one out of every three days for free, there's a good chance that you have an extra team member at the front, you have an extra hygienist, and you have an extra chair site assistant to support all of that gross production 
that you're not collecting, which means that's added cost and added effort. So there's a way out. And the way out is what we're showing you today. Just get your arms around the numbers. The first step in any change process, whether it be AA or changing your dental practice, is telling the truth. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you have to say, I'm an alcoholic, okay? And I got to start the press. In changing your practice, you have to say, I don't know where these numbers are. Let's find out where they're at. And Dina and Gina and our team, that's a big part of what they do is they get their arms around telling the truth around the numbers. And now we can start to change them. Now we're going to go into collections when you look at the insights for a thriving dental practice. Now we need to define it first. Collections are the amount of money that a dental practice actually receives from its services. So once that's all said and done, you get down to net collections, which is your collectible production. We're going to collect that money. And that's dollars in the bank. That's not, oh, she said she was going to bring a check or she's good for it. No, it's cash in the bank. And a couple parameters on this is the benchmark. Our goal as a practice should always be 100%. Always. You should always collect 100%. I say in some cases, it should be higher than 100% because we've been running on 94% for the last five or six years. And so there's back collections that need to be collected today or the AR is too high and now we're going to put a great system in place. Now, the disparity in there is really important because this is the truth of a lot of people that we get, get a chance to see. They're not at 100% of net collections. They might be at 96. And I'll go, you're a 96% collection. They go, that's good. No, no, it's good. It's good. I have Susie at the front. She's great. You know, she's been here. For, she came with the practice that I purchased and she knows everybody. I don't, you know, I don't want to upset the apple cart. Well, I get that. And there's some truth to how you feel, but we're still leaving 4% on the table every single month. And so I think it's a huge opportunity that if we develop Susie or at least train, you know, share some, share some thoughts. You can, you can improve that even by 2%. I think it should always be at a hundred percent. Um, and I'll call on you, Ange, any thoughts that you have on collections here? Cause this is a big part of what we do with practices. I agree because you're talking about the net collect, you're trying to collect what you've already written off. So all those adjustments, all those reasons why you've given people things discounted have already taken place. So what's left? I want you desperately to be collecting all of that. Right. And, uh, you know, I don't have enough time because I could talk about this one forever. If your collections, net collections are 96 or 95%, I can tell you there's already other problems in the practices. Your fee isn't probably high enough because there's a little bit of a poverty mentality around what we charge. We're not, we're afraid to charge what we're really worth, or we're afraid to discuss money. Once it gets healthy around money in a dental practice, and you can see collections are steadily at 100% or higher, usually the fees go up a little bit because we have more value for our time. Usually you'll see less collections because you're collecting more upfront and there's healthier communication around um, money in, in a dental practice. And so there's two key steps for reducing your collections gap is number one, have a great financial policy and make sure it's a very solid one. Everybody should have an incredible financial policy. You should review it once a year. Everyone should be aligned on it. And um, you should understand and work your AR. Your AR should be in healthy ranges. Um, and uh, we have several webinars on how to do that. Um, and so it's important to, to make sure that you, you got your arms around that. And so I would add a third to a good step to reducing your collections gap is get people out of the conversation that are bad at talking about money. I've said this many times. I'm the worst person to talk about money because I'll give it away for free. So if you're a dentist listening to this and you're terrible at making sure people pay and you go, oh my gosh, don't worry about it all the time. What you're doing is you're screwing up the whole process. So it's really good to just point to somebody like Angela, say, I'm going to take you up to the front. Angela's amazing. She'll help you with these questions that you have around the financial obligations regarding this dentistry. So we're talking about the collections gap. So again, if if we're going to review as we go along here is just making sure each one of these gaps is healthy. So in the gaps analysis process that we do, 
We're just looking for opportunities. Sometimes there's an opportunity up here. If we find a dental practice is writing off 33%, it's great to go to 23%. Maybe in a year, maybe in two years time, as you can see, we have more to play with as it starts to trickle down. If your dental practice that collects 95%, let's get it to 98% and then to 99%. Every single area that you tighten up just by a little bit, one more dollar falls ultimately to the bottom line. So let's talk about overhead as we move further down. So once we have production collections, now we're going to define overhead. And so there's two components to overhead. There's fixed expenses and there's variable expenses. Fixed expenses, we define them are costs that remain constant regardless of the levels of production. So no matter what you produce, it's still the same. For instance, your rent. That's an easy one. You know, you can double your production, your rent stays the same. Um, sometimes, depending on how you structure team compensation, fixed expenses can be team compensation. That's always a debatable one, but that's one that stays constant. What it really means is they are what they are and you won't have much impact on changing them. Now, I will tell you that as you grow your practice and you get more efficient, you collect more so these fixed expenses become less of an issue. So let me just throw that out there. If you're, if you're paying $8,000 a month in rent and you're only collecting $80,000 a month, it's eating away at your overhead. But once you start to grow your capacity, you know, your ability to collect and all of those things up front, it becomes less of an issue. The second component of your overhead are your variable expenses. And that can be defined as costs that fluctuate with the level of production or patient volume. And so a great one with variable expenses are your lab. So your lab is going to go up, obviously, with more of what you produce. Supplies will go up with more of what you produce. And what it means ultimately is there's a the potential to optimize these expenses in there. Anything else you would add about overhead, Ange? I think you covered it. Yeah. I think the important thing to understand about overhead, let me just go back to this, is people think, well, I'm paying my team too much. No, the truth of it is, is that most people aren't paying their team too much. The truth of most practices we see is that they're not collecting enough to support their payroll. So if you're writing off 33%, it usually means you have one extra person at the front and they're handling a lot of insurance processes and cancellations. So as you can see, it's a very inefficient pro practice. The other thing that they'll be is they'll be people dependent, which means they don't have a lot of systems in place. And so the more that you get clear about this, you're going to see that your overhead will change. I think in a day and age where 61% of dentists now say that their number one challenge will be for the rest of their career, finding, keeping, growing, and developing team members we have to have our arms around being a profitable practice. Now, if your overhead for team compensation is in its 30s, I can tell you there's a lot of opportunity. I wouldn't mess with people's compensation. But what I would do is I would start to get my arms around, okay, do we have systems in place? The more you put systems in place, you're going to see the level of output will be greater and you don't need as many hands. When you have a people dependent practice, you're just throwing person after person after person at the problem. If your team compensation is 33%, I'm going to guess what's happening in your practice. You probably have three amazing team members at the front and they are working their tail off. And they do everything uniquely every single time because they know every patient. And they're going to schedule a meeting with you today at the end of the day, Doc, because it's Thursday and we're wiped out. And we need to have a conversation. We need to talk. Don't you love that phrase? And they're going to pull you aside and go, Doc, we are so exhausted up front. We need some help. That phone rings off the hook because we have a lot of PPOs. We got a lot going on here. And you're a good hearted person. So you look at your three amazing people that just work super hard and you go, okay, I got your back. Let's hire somebody. And you throw another person at the challenge. Now you have to be able to see this clearly because what they really need is a better environment and a little bit more clear vision and how to do this. And so ultimately, as you become more systems dependent, you start to get your arms around this, you're going to see your costs are naturally going to fall into better ranges. One more thing I'm going to say about overhead is there are some people in dentistry that say, don't worry what your overhead is, just produce. 
That's crazy. That's like saying, don't worry what your cholesterol is. Just keep jogging. It's going to catch up to you after a while. And the other thing I always say is like, I live in Wisconsin. They have something called snow here. And when snow comes in big amounts, sometimes 21 inches, yes, it can shut down the whole city for a long time. And if you're a dental practice and you work 17 days a month and we get a lot of snow, it can mess up your cash flow. I don't know if you guys remember this, but a couple of years ago, we had major snowfalls in Washington, D.C. There were some of our practices that couldn't get out of their driveways for several days. And so that impacts cash flow. So I do think it's important to have a healthy overhead percentage. But your overhead percentage has more than just what's cash going out. It has to do with how many people do you have on your team? How many resources are we allocating to growing this gross production? So what I'm going to ask you to do in this webinar as a result of this webinar is when you take a look at this, you can start to see how much effort are we doing and what are the costs that are related to that? And a great coach can identify this right away. So overhead just isn't overhead anymore. There's a lot of pieces that are connected to that. And it's important to look at, at very fixed and variable expenses. Now, ultimately at the end, what you're going to do is you're going to fall into the profit range. Now, let me explain. There's net profit and then there's true profit. Net profit is defined as gross profit minus your your expenses. So you're going to take this from your PL. So your profit and loss statement, which is an important instrument, but I also say it's a terrible thing to just judge your dental practice with. Nobody's ever run a dental practice with just a profit and loss statement. A profit and loss statement shows you exactly what we were able to allocate for tax deductible reasons on expenses that went out, and that goes against our collections number. So it says, it basically shows you money you have left in earnings after you pay sometimes yourself, depending where or not you put that in your PL, your team and your bills. And I'm not here to slam dental accountants, but a lot of people, a lot of you work with dental accountants and they go, man, you're doing great. And you go, yeah, that's awesome, but I don't have any money. So at the bottom of your PL, it says that your gross profit after all your expenses is like 200 and some thousand dollars. And you're like, why don't I have any money? And your accountant's like, well, you're doing great because you're up $50,000 from last year. And then you repeat the process the next year. And now it's $250,000. And you're like, yeah, but I still don't have any money. What you're not seeing is what's called true profit, which doesn't show up on your PL. And it's your net profit minus your cash flow output. And what it really means is money you have left in earnings after you pay yourself, your team, your bills, plus taxes, loans, and distributions. They're actually your true profit. And so let me just say this before we go on to the next. Now, this was really interesting. I, I don't mind sharing this. Like when I got started at the age of 27, I didn't understand how taxes weren't deductible. Now, I, I was 27. I'm like, wow, I got to pay a lot of taxes. And also loans. These loans that you have, or you have a credit line. That's how Act Dental got started. Because I was I had a Toyota Camry with 171,000 miles. I'm like, I need some help and some stability. I got a credit line. I didn't understand that paying back this credit line that I was using for resources, how that wasn't tax deductible. And my accountant's like, listen, but those are not tax deductible. And that's a fast lesson to learn. So when it comes to loans and taxes and other things like that, those dollars have to be paid and they don't show up in a profit and loss statement. So it's important to get your arms around that and it ultimately refer, reflects true profit. And sometimes dentists just take on another note or another note or and one of the penalties of making more money or shoring more gross profit is you have to jump a few tax brackets sometimes. So it's important to be on the front end of that. So how do we have more true profit? We've got to shrink our gaps. Number one, the first thing to do is reduce your write-offs. Remember what I said at the beginning? Like, let's say we have 33% write-offs. If we go to 23%, bam, all of that falls right to the bottom line. We can reduce the gap between what we produce and what we collect. So that could mean, you know, just 
a combination of a couple of those things. We can also improve what we collect on a percentage basis. So if we go from 96% to 100 or 101, now all of that falls to the bottom line. Now it's also passing through fixed and variable expenses because you're not really picking up any expenses just by becoming more efficient. By becoming more efficient, it's all dropping to the bottom line. We could obviously reduce our overhead expenses and most of the reduction is gonna come from being more efficient and putting systems in place. And you can reduce your cash flow output. Here's a great way to do that is get your arms around the debt. Sometimes when people retire debt, they just take on more debt. So if you have a $5,000 a month loan payment, once that loan payment is retired, don't take on any more new debt. Take that and put it right into savings because you weren't using it in the first place. Just make sure it goes right in and out of your account right away. That's a great way to, uh, to endure, you know, improve net profit at the end of the day. When we got, when act, got started, we didn't have financial gaps. So a lot of times what I would have dentists do right out of the gate is like, okay, listen, first thing you're going to do is save 10%. They're like, well, I have no money. I'm like, well, can you save a hundred bucks a week? They'd say, okay, I can save a hundred dollars a week. And then they go, I've been saving this for a while. Let's go to a thousand bucks a week. And then they would get to 10% a month. And just by doing that, they were adding more and more net profit to the bottom. It's a great way to think. So again, just to review, the cash flow gap is another silent killer of profits. Because if you can see, look at the gross profit here, you can say, wow, our gross profit is great. That's actually wonderful. Well, at the end of the day, sometimes we see dentists that don't have any true profit because you know, they're paying, sometimes they're paying themselves additional compensation or they have debts that they're paying or taxes that come out of there too. So you wanna make sure that you have your arm around that. So that's the cash flow gap. And the moral of the story is this, and we're gonna pause for questions if you guys have any, is understanding the story behind your practice's data is crucial for enhancing profitability. So step number one is just start tracking. it. Now, even people that come in the academic community, they pro coaching, it's like, please, can you just start entering in these, these data points? And that's the first part. And secondly is making strategic, informed strategic decisions. You can start to analyze your production and collections, your overhead, your cash flow, and you can identify some of the efficiencies that happen. And ultimately, what you can do is you can start to close the gaps. So it's a great way to, to improve the entire process. Now, I want to stop here for just a second, Ange. And do we have any um, do we have any questions in the chat we, at all? Yeah, we do have a few questions. Um, what would be an optimal range in overhead as a percentage of gross collections? That is a really difficult question. I know I've started I'll several times in the chat to answer. <laughs> yeah, that's impossible to answer because I don't know your PPO par participation. Now, let me just go there and let me just sit here. Actually, let's do this. I'm going to show you a couple things. Um, can I... Can I answer your question? I'm going to take what I would consider. Okay, let me see. Can you see this yes. real quick? All right, so let me answer your question the best way I can. This is not super typical, but this is about the right ranges of what we see here at ACT when people come in. So let me give you an example. Um, Sometimes we get people that are producing anywhere between 1.2 and 1.8 million, and it's a single doctor practice. That's usually about the avatar that we see. And it could be a whole different range of what their gross production is. So gross production is probably one of the worst numbers because I do meet dentists that are 1.8. They go, my production's $1.8 million. Well, I don't know is that they're participating with every PPO under the sun and they have no money. So that's tough. And their write-offs, they're always wrong about their write-offs too. Nobody's ever correct on their write-offs. They go, well, I'm, I think I'm writing off like 25%. It ultimately becomes 33%. But let me answer your question as best I can. And I don't think there's a good answer only because I need to know what your collections are and I need to know more about your practice. Would you agree before I get into this, Ange? Yeah, there's so many different variables. 
Yeah. I, I would answer your question by saying this gross production is one of the worst numbers. It doesn't really tell me anything. It shows me how hard you worked and it shows me the potential, but I don't know what was in that gross production. Is that collectible, you know, type of thing, but hopefully this will help you. So let me take a scenario of a typical doctor. Somebody's working 209 days a year. They're producing 1.5 gross production. They're writing off 35%, which means their net production is 975. Now that hurts. That's like a third coming right off the top. They have Susie at the front. She's really sweet, but I don't, we don't train her. We just, we just let her do her thing. She collects 94%, which means what goes to the bank is $916,000. So I, I gave blood of 1.5 million and what hit the account was 916. So that's what my dental accountant sees is 916,500. So my overhead is 70%. Okay. And so, as you can see, the dollars that went out are 641,550. So my net profit at the end of the day is 274, you know, thousand dollars. But what you don't see is I have $7,200 a month in taxes and $7,000 a month in loan payments. And what hit my personal account is 104,000. Now, what most dentists do is they work the same amount of days and they say, I'm going to produce more. So I'm going to go from 1.5 to 1.8 because I'm learning a lot. Now my overhead, now my write-offs climb. So this is going to have a multifactorial, how'd you like that word, impact on what my overhead is because I'm writing off more. And if you're in shared agreements, that's what's going to happen. So my net production actually went up 1.044. But Susie's still collected 94%, which means, you know, you know, our collections went up from 916 to 981. So that's great. My overhead's still 70% because my fixed and variable costs change or grow with that. And so my overhead is $686,000 a year. I still have those loan payments and maybe I made a little bit more. Now, let me just change this a little bit. Here's what I would say to your question is like, this is what I like to see. Somebody working 209 days a year, if you were the dentist, I'd say that's way too much. Let's not do that anymore. Let's go to 199. I like 10 day increments. People go, oh, how am I going to do that? You're just going to do it. You're going to block off your kids' vacations. Let's go for it. And let's, in this scenario, say we're not going to produce anymore. And you'd be like, that's crazy. Most of our practices do produce more, but let's say for this sake, we don't produce anymore. But we're going to reduce write offs because I'm going to, have Angela coach us and she's going to start taking a look at our write-offs and she's going to scrutinize every penny that comes in and out and she's going to find discrepancies all day long. So we're, our write-offs are going to go from 35% to 10%. That is a 10% reduction in write-offs off the top, which means my net production without collecting $1 more, or I'm sorry, producing $1 more is going to go up. So now I've got a lot more to collect. And so Angela's also going to be coaching Susie on a couple verbal skills to use. Would you guys agree verbal skills matter? When you can have somebody go from, do you want to pay today to how would you like to take care of that today? It changes everything. So we're going to go from 94% to 99%, which means we're actually going to collect a significant amount of that. Now what hits the bank account, my dental, my dental account goes, whoa, 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 whoa. 916 to 113. What the heck happened? You go, Angela is my coach. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty cool. Now, here's my favorite part of this. And I hope this kind of answers your question. My overhead went down, but the amount of money I spent went up because your overhead percentage is a function of expenses that went out against your actual collections. So you can see my overhead went down five percentage points, but I actually spent more money. I hired a new team member. I actually made some improvements to lab. And this becomes the greatest opportunity. You guys all have great team members that are challenged and they're going to come to you and say, hey, listen, is any chance my pay can go up? And you're going to be thinking, well, I don't know how I can do this unless the practice gets healthier. This is the value of working with a great coach as they can start to show you where we can tighten each one of these gaps up. So 
it's not about working harder and harder and harder and harder because sometimes working harder, this is already too many days. You're working this many days, I can already tell you, you don't like dentistry. It's too much. You're exhausted. Your back probably hurts. You're probably seeing a chiropractor too. So there's only so much you can give and then you can't give any more. So this is why I'm a big fan of working smarter, not harder and knowing all of these numbers. Now, what falls to the bottom line, your accountant goes, holy moly, what happened here? Now, you're still making those payments, and ultimately, what hits the bottom line grows significantly. In a lot of cases, it can double. Now, these results aren't typical, but here's where you can see the opportunities that exist. So, I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, I see people adding operatories all the time. And I'm like, how many operatories yet? Three. Why? It's growth, man. I want to grow. Well, you're already working too hard. I know, but I'm getting an associate. This is my favorite one. Some guy said this to me in California. He's like, I'm getting an associate. I'm like, you have an associate? No, I'm getting an associate. Do you know what's your associate's name? Well, I don't have them yet. So I'm get I'm adding three operatories. And they were just growing to grow. And then what happens is, is you add some other thoughts to it. Like, well, I'm going to add an associate so I can take more time off. Well, you're adding three operatories for an associate you don't have. You're already writing off a third of everything that you're doing. And somehow you're going to be able to take more time away. Now, for some people that does work because they build and grow associates and they make them stable and they work out of it and they start developing their team. But a lot of people are just shooting from the hip. That's why we want you, as a result of watching this, just shh, take a look at your numbers. Be aware of your numbers. And when you have questions, raise your hand. Go, I don't know what this means. Here's one thing you can do. You can reach out to us. I'll tell you exactly what it means. If you want, I am so happy to get you connected to Gina and Dina on our team. And for $1,000, for $1,000, they'll analyze your entire business from head to toe. It's called the practice assessment. They'll show you where every dollar came in and every dollar went out and every single opportunity in there. And you don't even have to become a client if you don't want to. You, you can just do the assessment. That alone will be one of the best investments you ever make because you'll learn more about your practice from those two people than you will ever learn from an accountant or an expert in dentistry because that is all they do. They look at practice after practice after practice every single week. So, I'm so sorry that was a long-winded answer. I, as you guys can see, please don't take what I'm saying negative or I'm getting, I just love this stuff. I love it so much. I'm a geek about it. And so when we look at these and I care about the people behind these numbers, there's nothing that makes me happier than watching a young dentist come in or a mature dentist go, I really have my arms around the numbers now and I know what this means and I sleep better. I feel better. I'm not subjected to the winds that blow or I'm not looking for a new flashy type thing. There's a lot of value in that. So I'm sorry. Any other questions, Ange? I'm sure there's maybe one or two. Uh, I think I've handled everything in the chat. People were just kind of wanting some specific numbers. So I shared um, just cut some ranges. I would think that like 55 to 60% would be some pretty excellent overhead from our clients that I see, but. Yeah, 55 to 60% is usually, we'll see it sometimes higher than that a little bit, but you, there's usually a reason. I say this, anytime it's above 62, you're not relaxed. I've never seen a dentist that has a 64% overhead that's relaxed. You're running and gunning. Here's why. Because any dip in collections, you know who doesn't get paid? You don't. And you're picking up the slack. So you might have an associate you know, like I'm justifying this 64%, 65% over. Well, the associate comes to you one day and says, I, you know, I'm thinking about moving. And you go, oh no, you can't move. And so you have to pick up the slack from that. And that, that hurts, that hurts. So I like the idea of having margin. It's not about the money. It's about having emotional, you know, margin. Because when you have margin, you're not running and gunning. Dentists that I see that have overheads of 55%, they can withstand the fluctuations of the snow, the market, you know, trends. They, they're not in a hurry to run to the next patient. 
when a patient has a question, I'm like, yeah, let me answer some questions for you. Um, so I totally agree with you, Ange, in those ranges. Now, the other thing I'll add about overhead and why this is so important, I didn't have this in a slide. It's anyone's guess, but if you practice for 30 years, let's just say this, 30 years, you're probably going to have about $40 million running in and out of your business. Let's just say there's going to be $40 million of cash that are going to come into your business and out of it in 30 years because you'll end up producing more than a million dollars someday. And your challenge is to sliver enough of that so that it's, it's creating a path of some of that cash is just going right into your retirement. And so when you do this and you follow the gaps process, you can start to make more money and you can stop outrunning the wolf and you can go, wow, I'm making more money. Well, that's a perfect opportunity to retire the $5,000 a month debt payment. Say, I'm not taking on any more debt or we're growing. I've learned to live on this salary and now the excess goes into my retirement plan. Your retirement plan should never be the sale. The sale of your practice should be the cherry on top of what you've already done because you were disciplined enough early in your career to create the gaps and enough profitability that you slivered away 10% of it. What's really cool about saving 10% off the top is you can just keep working harder and it just disappears. You don't know where it goes. And then it creates compound interest on top of that and on top of that and on top of that and on top of that. And if you know the rules of seven, your portfolio doubles about every seven years if you keep doing that. So it becomes a wonderful way to be a good steward of the $40 million that'll come in and out of your hands during that time, if that makes sense. Kirk, I'm going to paste um, a couple links in the chat here for some resources. If people want to, you know, plug in their own numbers and play around with some of this, um, we have some great resources for you guys. Yeah. So cool, cool, cool. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'll I'll just finish. Uh, I, and you go first. Any final thoughts that you have, and then I'll wrap us all up. I just love when I see people. Um, not stress about their numbers anymore. And it all comes with, you know, not just taking that accountant's report and seeing the number at the bottom. So I would just urge you to, you know, print your reports out, take a look at them, put them in the spreadsheet like Kirk was talking about, figure out where your true effort lies. Um, and I think everybody will sleep better at night. So totally. I think at the end of the day, I mean, look, we're all working towards this result of trying to have a better practice and a better life. And we say this all the time, the money is never the goal. But when you have control of the money, you can truly say that. You can say, I don't really worry about the money because I work with Angela, I have a gaps. I know exactly where all the cash goes. I take a look at it once a month and I'm, I'm pretty on top of it. That becomes wonderful. And it just becomes a great way that you can truly sit with a patient. This is a, this is cliche, but we've heard this. You guys have all heard this. Patients know when you need it or they need it. And by doing this process mm -hmm. regularly, you can position yourself as somebody who doesn't need the patient to say yes today. You can truly look at a great patient and go, I, it's okay if you don't say yes. I don't need your money. If you want to do it, let's do it. And I'm so happy to do it, but I don't, I don't want you to do it just because I said to do it. Do you know what I mean? So, and that becomes a wonderful way to do this. And I'll leave you with one other thought because I could talk for hours on this. I've been doing this for 30 years and we watch a lot of people transition. Great dentist transitions. You know, the ones that do the best have something really great to sell. And if you're in the market of purchasing a practice, let's say you're a young dentist, the best practice is to buy are the profitable ones. Those are the best ones to buy. The hardest ones to buy are the ones that are not profitable. So you might be 52 watching this. And you're like, why should I do this? Well, someday you're going to transition. And if it looks really good on paper and you show them a gaps calculator and you go, hey, this practice is very profitable. You'll be very happy that you purchased this. You're going to get a higher dollar amount. And you're going to get a better buyer because people know that the best practices to buy are the healthy ones, not the monsters that don't have any profit. So um, I'll leave you with that. So there's multiple reasons to do this. Uh, and I hope, I hope this was helpful. So um, 
please reach out to us. We're so happy to help you um, every step of the way. Even if you have questions, feel free to reach out. We're so happy in any way. So, Ange, thanks for being on. Thanks, Kirk. It was fun. Yeah. And you're going to be here at the To The Top Study Club. In a couple of hours. In a couple <laughs> of hours. So, again, we've got the um, golden ticket. If you want the golden ticket, you can reach out to Gina. Um, but keep showing up. We're going to keep bringing it. So, until we see you guys next time, hope you guys have a better practice and a better, li better life. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.